Shall we turn to Romans chapter 11? As we finish chapter 10, God was standing with outstretched arms to the children of Israel all day. But they were not responding. Unto Israel, God said, All day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Paul had just shown how that the prophecies of the Old Testament did tell of God's work of salvation among the Gentiles. And how that they would receive. And he would be called their God. But unto Israel, all day long he had held out his arms to a disobedient and gainsaying people. Now from that we might conclude, well that does it, God is through with Israel forever. That is the end for Israel. God kept his promise. He sent the Messiah, but they rejected the Messiah. Therefore, God is through with Israel forever. And tragically, there are many ministers who take that posture and position. There are many who say that Israel has no place in God's plan in the future. And unfortunately, they stopped with chapter 10 of the book of Romans. You know, it's always dangerous to stop in the middle of a thought or an idea because it's easy sometimes to get the wrong conclusion. Half of a truth can be very dangerous. We need the whole truth. And so as we go on to chapter 11, Paul brings up that very subject and that very thought. Has God cast away his people? Is that the end for them? Is God through with the nation Israel? Does the Jew have no place in the plan of God now? And Paul answers, perish the thought. God forbid, or more literally, perish the thought. I think that it is indeed sad and tragic that among many ministers there is deep anti-Semitism. I get mail quite often from ministers who are seeking to rebuke me because of my stance of support for the nation of Israel. And they say, don't you know God is through with the Jews? That God's work with Israel is finished? They've rejected. They had their chance. It's over. We are now Israel. The church is Israel. And these men are so opposed to the idea of God still working with Israel they are so filled with hatred for the Jew that they hate me because I love the Jew. And I get this hate mail. But would to God they would listen to Paul here in Romans 11. Is God through? Has God cast away his people? Perish the thought. God forbid. And so the proof that Paul offers that God has not cast away his people is, I'm an Israelite. God hasn't cast away Israel. I'm one. 
Had God cast away Israel, then I would be out. I am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, and I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. The second proof that he offers that God has not cast away Israel is from the prophecies of the Old Testament, especially that of Elijah. But Paul declares plainly, God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. God foreknew the things that would transpire when he chose them. God knew that they would despise and reject his son. God prophesied it. We read it in Psalms tonight, a thousand years before Jesus was born. David writing of him said, and he is despised. And they shook their lip at him saying, he trusted in God to deliver him. Let God deliver him now if he will have him. And that's exactly what the high priest said at the crucifixion of Jesus when they were mocking and saying, well, if he's the son of God, let him come down off the cross and we'll believe him now. And the high priest, chuckling and mocking to his friend, said, Yeah, he, he trusted in God. Let God deliver him now if he will have him. The very thing David prophesied. The high priest spoke. As they despised. God knew that. You see, he told it in advance. In Isaiah 53, he is despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He was smitten. We esteemed him not. Talking about the people of Israel, they didn't esteem him. But then Isaiah went on to say, but he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. So God foreknew these things. Has God cast them away? No, God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Don't you know that the scriptures, what the scriptures declared by Elijah, one of the greatest prophets of Israel, How that Elijah, when he was making intercession to God against Israel. That's an interesting thing. We usually think of interceding for somebody. And intercession is usually thought in a, in a positive sense. And thank God that's the way the intercession is for us. Jesus is interceding for us. I'd hate to have him interceding against me. Sometimes ministers have a tendency to get discouraged. Sometimes God's servants have a tendency to get discouraged. And rather than interceding for the people, they begin to intercede against the people. And that was Elijah's condition during discouragement. Ahab and Jezebel had brought in Baal worship to Israel. And they had many hired priests of Baal. But the altar of the Lord was forsaken. And Elijah had had a contest. They gathered together the 400 priests of Baal. And Elijah, the lone prophet of God, challenging them. To build altars, but not to put any fire under the altar or upon the altar, but let them pray to their gods. And the God that answered by fire, let him be God. And after the prophets of Baal had spent the morning praying, crying upon their God with no results, as the afternoon went on, Elijah began to chide them and said, I'll bet he's on a vacation. <laughs> and 
And, and he really got a little coarse. He said, perhaps he's going potty. <laughs> Maybe you should cry a little louder. And so they began to cry louder, cutting themselves, leaping on the altars. A lot of emotion. There can be a lot of emotionalism within religious systems. And finally he said, okay, fellas, you've had it. Stand back. Dig a trench around my altar. Now pour some water on it. Pour more water on it. Till the thing was soaking and the trench was filled with water. And he, Elijah then prayed and God sent the fire and consumed the sacrifice plus the altar, plus licked up all of the water in the trenches. And all of the people fell on their face and said, Jehovah is God. The Lord, he is God. Elijah took the priest of Baal down to the Kishon there and killed them all. He did this because wicked Jezebel happened to be away. When she heard what was going on, she hastened back. When she found out that Elijah had wiped out all of her prophets, the, the priests, the 400 priests, she said, God, do so to me and more if I don't have the head of that prophet, Elijah. And so Elijah began to run from Jezebel. And he ran from the area of Mount Gilboa, south, past Beersheba, which is probably 150 miles, 125 miles from Mount Gilboa, ran past Beersheba, didn't stop until he got cleared down in the Sinai to Mount Horeb. And there he hid in a cave. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the prophet saying, Elijah, what are you doing here? And here is where he made intercession against Israel. For he answered the Lord, verse 3, Lord, they have killed your prophets... And they have digged down your altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. God, you're almost out of business. <laughs> I'm the only one left, and they're trying to kill me. If she catches me and wipes me out, Lord, you're, you've had it. It's all over. But what did the Lord answer him? God answered, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. It is interesting how that Satan so often seeks to isolate us and to make us feel that we are all alone in our devotion or in our commitment to God. Nobody else really cares. Nobody else is really stirred by this. Nobody else is really concerned at all. They're all going on. I'm the only one trying to carry this whole burden, you know. And, and Satan likes to make us feel very isolated like we're the only one who still believes in purity. We're the only ones who still believe in living a righteous life. You know, and he tries to make you feel very, very isolated and alone. He really works on that principle of isolation. God, they've killed all your prophets. They've destroyed your altars. And I only am left. And they're trying to find me to kill me. 
Not so, Elijah. You're not alone. There are 7,000. At this present time, there are 7,000, a remnant, who have not bowed their knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, Paul said, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Even as Paul was writing to the Romans, there were many Jews who believed in Jesus. God's faithful Jews. When Jesus was born, the father of and mother of John the Baptist, faithful remnant. When Jesus was brought to the temple to be presented unto the Lord, that faithful priest, Simeon, who took Jesus into his arms and said, Oh, now, Lord, let your servant depart in peace because I have seen your salvation. He was a faithful remnant of God. Even as was Anna, that elderly lady, who came in at that very time and began to prophesy over this child what God was going to do. God always has his faithful remnant. And among the Jews, there are always those faithful remnant of God who are believers through the election of grace. Now, we read in the scriptures of a terrible time that is going to come very soon upon the earth. And in that days there shall be great tribulation such as the world has never seen before or will ever see again. The history of man is pretty desperate. There have been some horrible atrocities and bloodbaths in history, but nothing to equal what the earth is yet facing. And during this time that the earth is going to be going through this great tribulation, God will still have his faithful remnant because in Revelation chapter 7 we read, where God seals 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe who become his witnesses during this period of great tribulation. God has always had his remnant among the Jews, Paul is declaring. Has God cast away his people? Perish the thought. God forbid. God has not cast away Israel. I'm an Israelite, Paul said. And there have always been those who were faithful to God. As Elijah discovered when he was interceding against the people saying, God, I'm the only one left. God said, no, you're not. I've got 7,000 who have not bowed their knee to Baal. And Paul said, even at the present time, there, are, there is that faithful remnant. And there will always be. But, Those faithful remnant have received, even as we have received, through faith, that work of God and the work of God's grace. The remnant according to the election of grace. Now there are people who get disturbed when the subject of election is brought up. That God has elected. God speaks of his elect. This is election according to grace. Man doesn't elect that way. Man elects according to merit, worthiness, abilities. 
I was watching the high school kids playing volleyball. Well, yeah, I played a little bit too. <laughs> but I was watching them as they decided to choose up teams. And having watched them play a little volleyball, I was interested in watching them as they picked their teams because, you know, there, it was an election according to grace. It was election according to ability. And those who had real ability, they were the first ones elected on that team, you know. And that's only wise. If you're a captain and you want to have a winning team, you're going to elect according to ability. Not so with God. God didn't elect me because of my ability or anything else about me. Not because I was worthy, deserving, good-looking, or anything. Thank God. <laughs> His election was according to grace. Always so. Now, God has elected. Predestined. Chosen. And called me. All according to grace. The interesting thing to me. Is that he always does this on the basis of foreknowledge. He spoke here about. God has not cast away his people which he foreknew. He always has that foreknowledge, an election of grace by foreknowledge. If you had the capacity that God has and could know before what the end result was going to be, You had the capacity of knowing all things as God knows. So you know what the final result is going to be every, every time. And then you were given the choice of electing. Would you elect losers? You'd be rather dumb if you did. Of course you wouldn't. You'd elect only winners. Say that you had this knowledge and you went to San Anita. <laughs> Would you elect the losers or the winners? Of course you'd elect the winners. That so thrills me. Because God has only elected winners. means I'm a winner. I can't lose. God has elected me according to the election of grace. Now, Paul shows how that grace and works are mutually exclusive. Verse 6, probably one of the greatest statements in the Bible on how these two things are mutually exclusive. If it is by grace, then it is not of works. Otherwise, grace is not grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. So it can't be by grace and works. as there were those who were trying to declare in Paul's day that it was a combination of grace and works. But if it's of grace, it can't be of works. Otherwise, it isn't of grace. It isn't because you have deserved it. It isn't that you have earned it. It's not that you can earn it. God has elected you 
simply because he loves you and chose you and elected you on his grace. And by virtue of his grace. And it excludes works completely. Otherwise it's no more grace. If it is of works, it can't be of grace. It is no more of grace. And yet how we so often are trying to combine the two. It even is reflected sometimes in hymnology within the church. There was a song a while back that was being sung quite a bit. I'm glad that they don't sing it anymore. I always thought that it was poor theology. Let me be worthy of your love you have for me. Let me be worthy of your death on Calvary. The person who wrote that song doesn't understand grace at all. As I was drinking the cup tonight, I thought, oh God. No way I could ever be worthy. No way I could ever deserve your love for me. And I drank it through grace. Receiving the grace of God towards me. Not because I'm worthy or deserving or could ever be. No way I could ever be worthy of his death on Calvary. And yet, it seems that as Christians we are constantly striving to be worthy. And that is why Christians are so often frustrated. Because they're trying so hard to deserve the goodness of God. Oh God, I'll prove to you that you made a good choice. And how many years I promised God I was going to be better next week. <laughs> Sunday nights was always my night of renewal. <laughs> God, I blew it this week again. I'm sorry, Lord. Oh, I'm so sorry, God. But this next week, Lord, I'm going to make it. And I struggled. I didn't miss the mark because I wanted to miss the mark. I missed the mark because I was weak. Because I was just a poor shot. I missed the mark because I couldn't hit it. You say, well, shame. <laughs> you know what the mark is? Jesus said, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. All right, tell me you haven't missed the mark. Stand up and tell us that you're perfect. <laughs> we recognize our imperfection, and yet, Lord, next week I'm going to be perfect. No. Nope. God elected me on the basis of grace, not my works or not what work I could do for him, but just on the basis of his grace. And that's where my standing is tonight. It isn't that God elected me through grace and now I've got to earn it. I was elected by grace, but I stand by my works. You know, I was saved by grace, but now it's up to me to work out my salvation with fear and trembling. Oh, how many times I had that scripture misquoted to me because they put the period right there. 
and I was doing my best to work out my salvation. And believe me, I was fearful and trembling because I knew that I wasn't making it. I knew that I was failing. But when I picked up the Bible and began to read it for myself, I didn't put the period there. I went on and finished the scripture and it said, For it is God that works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Yeah, I can handle that. God working in me, giving me the will and giving me the ability. That's grace. And it takes it from the realm of works into grace again where we must leave it. My salvation is so important to God. So important to God. That he would not allow it to rest on anything so tenuous as my good work or my ability or my faithfulness or my holding on or my anything. My salvation is so important to God, he has taken upon himself the responsibility of seeing me through. And it is his work that has brought me eternal life. For by grace are you saved through faith. And even that is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, and it's not of works, lest any man should boast, for you are his workmanship. God knew he dare not depend on you to come through in the pinch can't do it. So he's taken it upon himself. He said, well, I don't know if I like that. Well, let me tell you, I love it. I revel in it. I thank God for his grace towards me, wherein I stand. Not of works, because if it was works, then it could not be of grace. They are mutually exclusive. So, you have the choice. Receive the grace of God, be accepted in Christ, or go ahead, be perfect. (laughs) And present yourself to God in your own perfection and see if he'll have you. See if he'll accept it. I'll take grace. Father, we thank you for that grace that you have shown to us and that you have shown to Israel. That it is not of works, for their works were bad. They despised and rejected the Holy One, the just. Your electing them, Lord, wasn't according to works, but according to grace. Because Abraham believed you. It was his faith that was accounted for righteousness. Lord, may we just believe tonight that glorious grace of God and thus receive tonight of that fullness of Christ, his work and his love within our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.